meeting is being recorded. Okay, welcome to Applying Psychology at whole trust level. Um, this session is part of Applied Psychology's 10th birthday celebrations. So thank you for being part of today. The purpose of this session is twofold. If you're joining us from a school, it's very much to encourage school leaders within trusts to think about how they might use educational psychology time in different ways in which to achieve greater impact. For educational psychologists or other multi-agency workers joining us, it is to help you to reflect on current opportunities within your own practice for how you might apply psychology at a broader, more systemic level. So I'm delighted to welcome Darren Holmes and Dr. Laura Partington to today's session. Um, and Darren and Laura, could I ask you to start by introducing yourself and to say a little bit about your current role? Do you want me to start, David? Yeah, that'd be great, Darren. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, yeah, good afternoon, colleagues. My name's Darren Holmes. Uh, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Enquire Learning Trust. We're a, a large mat. We're based in Wakefield. Uh, we have schools uh, in the north, which is essentially the Tees Valley, North Yorkshire, and over into the uh, North Yorkshire coast. We've got another cluster of schools uh, based in Manchester, and we've got a cluster of schools which is situated around the, the Humber estuary, particularly Lincolnshire, Grimsby and Hull. Uh, with 30 schools in total, all primary, which is uh, one of our, our key points of distinctiveness. All our schools are improving and all are currently rated good or better by Ofsted. Uh, and actually, just incidentally, uh, I am speaking to you uh, in a quiet moment. In, we've been inspected in two schools at the minute, uh, and this is a, a quiet moment across two, two days inspection. So if somebody does come interrupt me, pl pl please forgive me. Uh, I, I don't think they will, but yeah, pl please bear with me on that one. Uh, we serve 11,000 pupils uh, in total. We've got about 1,600 staff, of which 580 are teachers. Uh, and like applied psychologists, uh, we're psychologists, we've been uh, in, op in operation for 10 years. Thanks, Darren. That's brilliant. And, and Laura? Yeah, hi, I'm Laura Partington, and I'm one of the core principal educational psychologists at Applied Psychologies. So my role currently is something of a three-way split. So firstly, I hold some leadership responsibilities within the Applied Psychologies team. So that includes some supervision of other colleagues and some strategic leadership of specific development areas within the team. Secondly, I work as a school EP, serving a patch of schools in Teesside and North Yorkshire. So a large amount of my patch is Darren's North Hub schools within the Enquire Trust, and I have some other ones as well within the local area. And thirdly, I have this additional third pot of time as the lead EP for our contract with the Enquire Learning Trust. And it's this part of my role um, where we do the strategic development work. Um, and that's the focus of the session today. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. And thanks, Darren, for those introductions. So the plan for this session, I'm going to ask a few questions to Darren and Laura to unpick the trust EP working relationship. But then we're going to open the floor up to you, the attendees, to ask any questions that you might have. As Darren and Laura are chatting through, um, if you have any questions or anything pops up in your mind, pop them in the chat function and I'll be able to monitor that and then ask some of those questions um, at the end. Okay. So first question and the two parters. Um, Darren, what was the rationale behind working with applied psychologists at trust level? And for you, Laura, as an educational psychologist, what does this look like in practice? So, David, I think there's, I think there's three things, really, three broad headlines. So the, the first one is, uh, is all to do with the children, uh, which is why we're here in the first place. The second bit is just around general school improvement initiative and the fact that we view psychology as a school improvement intervention rather than just a pupil, a pupil, a pupil intervention. And the third one is just around trust development and the way that we see trust development and how your service fits into that agenda for us. So I'll, I'll start with the, with the pupils first. Uh, what we've got across the trust is a significant number of children uh, with special educational needs. So you look at the national data, and I think it's about 13% of children, isn't it, who've got an identified special educational need nationally. When you look at our data, it's about 17%. So we're well above national in terms of the, the actual numbers of children we, we identify. Uh, when you compare us to large trusts, similarly, similarly sized trusts, we're very much above national. So you look at the, uh, the data that the DFE keeps around special education 
invested in in large multi-academy trusts and it's about 5.8 percent so we're very much above national in terms of our our, pu our pupil pupil population and i have to say uh, we've gone through this really robust exercise as well as making sure that what we don't do is confuse special education need and underachievement. So when I talk about us, our almost 17% of children, we very, very clearly identified them. And we've got a very, very clear understanding of what their needs are based upon a really robust assessment, which, which you've you've assisted with. Uh, and and so the, so the demographic meant that we did we just needed to make sure that we were as good as as good at meeting need and as good at inclusion as we could possibly be. Uh, if we weren't, we'd be failing almost 20% of our kids. Uh, and that's something we could never countenance. Uh, the success we've had with those particular pupils and the success that we're perceived to have had in, in terms of public accountability has meant that we've also become a choice destination for, for parents of pupils with the special education needs as well. So not only have we identified our, our children, we're, 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 we're bringing more in because people recognise that there's, a, there's, a, there's some considerable expertise being built in the trust uh, and, and the parents want their children to, to have a bit of that. Uh, I mentioned uh, public accountability. Uh, in the sort of 34 Ofsted inspections we've had in the last six years, uh, what we're noticing increasingly as time goes on is the, the statements around our special educational needs provision is, is, is strengthening all the time. The two that I'm involved in at the in it. Uh, I don't know the outcome of the inspection yet, but I do know that what they will refer to is very strong practice and a lot of capacity within school to meet need. Uh, so, and, and I think that's a, that's that's something that we, we wanted to achieve right at the start. We've also seen a really significant increase in the number of pupils with very complex needs. And again, uh, the pandemic's driven an acceleration in that number, but it's not just limited to, to, to COVID-19. Uh, it's just around the, the, the nature of the communities that we serve. There's additional complexity in there and, and sometimes reduced resilience as well. And, uh, and then what we have is this huge, uh, huge agenda where we do know that all our children with SEN uh, who don't have significant cognitive challenges, we're expecting those children to reach age-related age expertise uh, and better. And at the point that we entered into the contract with applied psychologists, we knew that that was, was something that we wanted to work at. We just also knew that we didn't have the knowledge and the capacity to be able to do it on our own. So those are, those are around the kids. In terms of school improvement, uh, we just wanted to move beyond a casework approach to, to, to EP support. We just uh, knew we wanted something different. We want we we all our schools before they became they joined the trust, had, had lived with that model of uh, of APs arriving in school, uh, working with one or two children across the course of a day, and the school being left with a piece of paper which may have had some utility and may not have had some utility, but the impact of that particular work on that child and on that teacher and on that class I felt was limited. We wanted to move beyond that. We were also just a bit concerned by the capacity that we, we, we were noticing in some of the local authorities we were working with. So local authorities didn't really have the capacity to service their statutory work and their commission work. Uh, and we, we wanted to make sure we got a, a, a we, we, we broke out of that cycle and, and, and chose someone in the marketplace who, who didn't have those conflicts. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were therefore building our schools capacity as well. So we, we wanted our people to have additional expertise as a result of working with very, very expert colleagues. Uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that there's lots of professional development for our teachers, that we've got special projects going on that we can we can roll out for ourselves because you've taught us how to do them. Uh, and we wanted some very specialist and very impactful uh, uh, interventions for individuals, groups, and, 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 and often whole classes of kids. And I'm thinking about the, the Working On What Works programme there, which we found to be re really, really successful. We also wanted an, an ongoing relationship with an EP. We wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, Laura mentioned she services our schools in the North. That's been really important to us. And we want, that's, that's been a, an important feature of the work we've done that you've almost, be, you've almost ceased to become an external party. Uh, our schools view you as part and parcel of their operation. Uh, but what you always bring to the table is that external critique of our work, which is useful in terms of SEN, but it's also really useful in terms of other stuff that we do as well. And that's the sort of incidental benefit of 
of, of working with, with, with you lot. Uh, and, and what we wanted to do is, 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 is work with a, an organization that appreciated that different local authorities have got slightly different approaches in terms of statutory assessment. They've got slightly different, uh, slightly different uh, ways of doing things. And we just needed an organization that was flexible enough and, uh, and dynamic enough uh, and responsive enough to be able to help us to deal with that. So those are the school improvement imperatives. But then there's some trust stuff as well. Uh, and I always thought, think that when you're changing a supplier or changing a partnership uh, or changing anything within the trust, that's it's an opportunity to sort of re-embed and revisit the things that the trust's all about in the first place. So, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that we engaged with partners who shared our values. And, uh, and, and our values are, are really, really clear. The two main ones are we put kids first every time and we believe that every child can be a powerful learner. Uh, and you don't say exactly those words, but uh, I don't think we've ever had a, a significant clash of, of uh, at, the, at the level of values. We've never, we've never disagreed around this. Uh, we have this alignment of botheredness. Uh, it's a word we use an awful lot, botheredness. Uh, we are extraordinarily bothered. And what's brilliant about uh, the partnership with uh, Applied Psychologies is that we find you lot extraordinarily bothered as well. Uh, and your our, our collective botheredness and your expertise added into that really really makes a difference. Uh, we wanted it has to be credible, it has to be authoritative. It's got to be credible and authorities for parents. It's got to be credible and authorities for for pupils and our, and local authorities. But it's also about our professionals as well. You know, we wanted someone who our professionals could really look up to and trust, seek advice from, and then implement that advice with total confidence. Uh, and really importantly, we wanted a, a trust-wide approach. So we inherited a mosaic of different kinds of approaches where different schools in different areas were doing things slightly differently. And we wanted to make sure that we got a, a unified approach across the trust. So uh, we wanted to make sure we work with one particular organization. We didn't want individual schools to be entering into piecemeal, piecemeal partnerships with, with different people, even though some of those were, were, were all right. We wanted it to be one, one organization because this is about, for me, it's about systematic development uh, and it's about building our general capacity and general expertise. Pragmatically, there's stuff as well, which you can't ignore. The one is it's cost effective. Uh, you, we, we, we share the risks equitably, which I think is important. And we've always found the, the, the service to be very, very reliable. When, when we need you, you're there. Uh, and our school leaders say that the contract is very responsive to, to school needs. And the last thing is we quite like you, really, uh, which I think is important. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. That, Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Darren. Um, I love the term botheredness and how we share very similar um, views on, on being bothered in the work that we do. So, Laura, what is it like in practice for, from an educational psychologist's perspective? Yeah, I really like this question because I think lots of EPs talk ideologically about wanting to work systemically and strategically, but pinning down how do we do that, what does that look like, how does that work unfold is, is a really important question, I think. So to explain how we've made it work in practice in our partnership, I'll talk a little bit about how we deliver our service across the trust and then how my role as the lead EP for the Enquire Trust contract fits into that wider picture. So... Firstly, it's useful to say that we have um, moved this year anyway to a, a situation where we have got an area EP or in some instances a team of a couple of EPs within an area who work directly with the schools in each of the, tr the trust's three geographic hubs. So as Darren mentioned earlier, there are um, schools spread out across broadly three kind of geographic areas across the north. So we've got local EPs to each of those areas who serve the trust schools. So this is our Enquire Trust EP team, if you like, which this year consists of six colleagues from within Applied Psychologies working across those three areas. So those people are in schools on a regular basis, working directly with staff to deliver their day-to-day -day EP service based on whatever priorities are raised by the SENCOs and the school leaders in those settings. So often there is an element of casework to that, as you would expect. But our team members on the ground are also working with those schools to deliver training, um, staff supervision, drop-in consultation sessions for teachers and all sorts of other things just based on each school's individual needs. So that's the kind of individual school level work. 
Then there is this additional pot of time set aside specifically for development work across the whole trust, which is the bit that's delivered by me in addition to my work within the North Hope Schools. So this central pot of time involves me working closely with the trust central team, which is specifically those people who are leading on SEND within the trust, but also some of the colleagues as well, depending on what it is that we're focusing on and who's best placed to be there. And what we do is work together to identify priorities and plan the work that is needed in each of those priority areas. So in many ways, I approach this as I would if I was working with an individual school. So I start with a, a planning meeting at the beginning of each academic year. We sit down and we map out what are the things that we're wanting to work on, what we're going to prioritise and how will we divide up the time according to serve all of those purposes. Um, and then we kind of check in on that plan regularly because as you know, life in schools being the way that it is, plans evolve in response to challenges and needs that arise over the course of an academic year. So I have lots of opportunities to check in with that central team about where we're up to, what we need to do next and so on. So currently I devote one day a week to this work. So usually I work for the Enquire team every Wednesday and colleagues from the central team also have some Wednesday time available. So this provides opportunities for conversations on a weekly basis if we need them to check in about something or just to update each other really on the work that we've been doing um, that links in with shared goals and shared priorities. So th this kind of system of having EPs on the ground regularly in schools and having me in regular contact with the central team it means that we also have plenty of opportunities for information sharing in both directions. So, for instance, if we have EPs working in schools and they notice something that indicates maybe there's a need here for a bit more thinking around how we support a particular group of children in this school, there's an emerging need that they happen to have a lot of children with autism, for example. How might we support that school with that? Um, perhaps there's a staff training need in some instances. So when EPs are noticing particular things within their working schools, they can share those things with me and I can feed those reflections back to the central team who are then really well placed to follow up with that school and plan any additional input that the trust can provide to input any additional support or training to staff that might be needed to make sure that all of the schools are getting everything that they need. So the communication mechanism also works the other way. So when there are particular things that the central team within the trust have identified as key priorities, for example, or maybe we've been working together on a new tool or resource or a process that we've developed that we want to trust school staff to use. I can share these ideas with the Enquire team EPs and they can emphasise those things when they're having conversations in schools. Um, often it's just a case of reminding staff that these things are available if they need to use them, but it just ensures that there's some join up and make sure that the work that EPs are doing with their individual schools complements the support that's already available within the trust. So there's, there's always this kind of to and, and fro of information flow and, and it strengthens the partnership at all, all stages. It also means that if for any reason a school has a question or a concern or something that isn't quite working for them about their, their EP service, or for some reason they don't feel able to have a conversation directly with their EP, that can also be raised centrally and I can work collaboratively with colleagues in the trust central team to address any issues and find positive ways forward that meet everyone's needs. And actually over the time that I've been doing this work with the Enquire team, we've had examples of all of those types of information sharing happening each time to really positive effect, we always find a really positive solution to anything that arises that works for everyone. Um, and actually the information sharing is something that I'm really keen to develop even more this year. So we're moving towards a system within applied psychologies of having regular termly check-ins for the Enquire team EPs, which can hopefully strengthen that information sharing mechanism even further. Um, so that feels like a bit of a whistle stop to it, but in a nutshell, that's essentially how the practicalities of organising the work are managed. It's about having people on the ground in the schools, having me as the central team contact person and having lots of information flow in both directions to make sure there is join up about what's happening when it's happening and that everyone is on the same page in terms of public priorities, initiatives and support that needs to be put into individual schools. Brilliant. Thank you, Lauren. I really great description of systems and processes and, and putting those in place as the bedrock then to be able to apply the psychology um, at individual school level, but also at a whole trust level as well. So we've been working in this way for quite a couple of years now. Um, Darren, what impact have you seen within schools and across different levels across the trust? And Laura, what have been some of your successes in applying psychology? So I'll, I'll, yeah, thanks, David. I'll, uh, 
I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll think about those three headings as well. So the first one is the children get a better deal. That's the bottom line. That our children get the better deal now in relation to uh, special education needs than they ever did. Uh, and again, that's about the expert support and the building of capacity and building of expertise among among our, our own staff. That's that's had that impact. You know, they have access to better teaching. The interventions are sharper, better planned. The resources are more appropriate. And what we've managed to do is to really build, I think, with applied psychologists and our CENCOs and our central SEN team, uh, a, a really authentic culture of inclusion across our schools which benefits everybody so I'd, I'd stress that as well David that when I'm not just talking about the children with special education needs getting a better deal I'm talking about all the 11,000 children who attend our schools get a better deal because our work around inclusion is more powerful and more effective I think it affects every single person uh, digging down into school uh, our staff are certainly more expert and more confident in 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 their expertise but they're also more willing to seek help and guidance when they need it they know they know the limits of their expertise uh, and understand that there's a lot that they know but there's also a lot more that they don't know and they know that, that they've got confidence that they've got confidence that their questions can be answered authoritatively and helpfully we've also had uh, it, it's had a significant effect on our, on our leadership capacity across the across the trust. Again, that's felt mostly in terms of our Senco and our Senco development, but it's leadership capacity per se as well. It is that it is that uh, that understanding that if leaders use a body of theory to underpin their work, uh, they find they, they find it makes massive massive as massive benefits on 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 their work work in general. Uh, the, the the systemic approach that we've taken together around developing inclusion as a system rather than a school by school basis means that the collaboration between between schools around special education needs and inclusion is just much more powerful than it ever would be. We've got aligned systems. Uh, we've got a, a common way of looking at things, a common way of talking about things. We've got a, a set of expectations around our pupils with special education needs that everybody understands. And in Increasingly, our schools have got shared priorities, which means that they can work on those together and they can really take advantage of the collaborative advantage, which comes past and parcel with joining a, an effective and strong, strong trust. trust. Uh, so a lot of the work that you've done is around special uh, around CPD and training and really, really working with us around that culture of inclusion. But the statutory processes that we have to undertake as a, as a, as a result of children having special education needs, they've been accelerated as well. And, and just for context, we work in eight local authorities of those eight local authorities. Uh, I think six of them are currently uh, their, their, their special education needs functions are are, are, are under special measures from from Ofsted, but even despite that, we've seen an acceleration in terms of the statutory work that that we that we undertake, uh, and the work of the the applied psychologist professionals, we find it's really complementary to our internal uh, SEN team and our internal processes as well. And then the other two things, I suppose, you know, we're talking about uh, things that have been successful. I think it's it's. You know, these are nuts and bolts really uh, but, but really important the operational side of it is that you know we always communicate and the communication i think is really strong you know that idea that laura talked about there of you know having regular meetings with Anne and and, and ellen and making sure that we're all really aware of what uh, of of what the system's looking like is is really important that gets picked up at governance level through the through the trust leadership team uh, and through and through the board of trustees so they are familiar with the work that happens and and can challenge us effectively around that and the contract is managed really responsively so we know if there's the extra resource that, that we need uh, we know that we can we can we can be adaptable and, and and make that arrangement likewise if there are schools that haven't used the the resource uh, the, the resource for whatever reason we know we can have that conversation about how do we shift that resource around uh, so that's been really important. And then the other one is uh, just around financial control. You know, and again, this is it's really, it's really boring and pragmatic stuff, this, but it is really important from my perspective as trust CEO. Uh, we're, we're just in more, more in control of the finances around educational psychology. 
uh, than, than if individual schools were brokering individual individual decisions with individual EPs. Uh, and it means that there's an equity across our schools. So when, when we look at who's using the EP service and what they're using it for, we get a really picture across our whole trust. And if we see that somebody is not using it uh, particularly well, we're able to challenge and intervene there because we know that there might be children there. We, we know who's on the register. We would be able to challenge and ask why that's not happening in the way that we, we might expect it to happen. Or likewise, we're able to point to areas of really, really good practice. So there's a financial control and an equity area. Uh, and the fact that it's not cheaper is not an issue. We do this on based on quality, don't we? That's that's the thing. So I, I always think, that, you know, if, you, if you're going to do something really well, and that's what we were determined to do at the outset, that uh, actually it's, 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 it's well worth, well, well worth the, 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 the cost of doing it. I have to say it's not any more expensive either, but it, it's, it's not something that's been, been particularly taxing for us that. Brilliant. Th thanks, Darren. Thanks. And I think the, the fact we have a three year contract in place with you that we review um, every three years, again, just demonstrates the commitment you have in us as a service, but our commitment to you to putting in some of those longer term plans um, as well. And so from our perspective, that works really well. Yeah, that, that, yeah that, I should have mentioned that, Dave. That's been really, really important that, you know, that that long term commitment for both parties means that that long term thinking can really take hold and that cultural cultural impact can be really felt. And uh, yeah, it's something that, yeah, it's something that I'm, I'm really glad we did and I'm really glad we continue to do it. Brilliant. Thanks, Darren. So over to you, Laura, some of the successes um, from from the work that you've been doing. Yeah, it, it's really hard to know where to start to answer this question, because I feel like in a relatively short time, just a couple of years or so, we've done so many different things. And I was really struck there hearing Darren's reflection about 11,000 children having, a, you know, better outcomes as a result of some of the work that we have been able to do together. And that, in terms of success, I mean, that's amazing to think about. I've never quite considered it in those terms that there might be that many number of children impacted by the work that we're doing. That was a really powerful reflection for me. So thanks for sharing that, Darren. Um, but I think from my, my personal um, perspective, some of the successes that we've had, I'll talk around a few of the specific initiatives that we've developed and some of the specific pieces of work that we've, we've been involved in over the last couple of years to just illustrate the different ways that we've applied psychology and the different sorts of projects that we've been able to develop with the time that we've had available. So I think one of the successes, one of the standout successes for me of the last couple of years has been the professional development of SENCOs. And I think we've done a lot of relationship building to help facilitate that really effectively. So I've been really um, fortunate to be able to attend SENCOR networks and SENCOR hub days. So the network days are something that happen three times a year. And these are an opportunity for all SENCOs from across the trust to get together for a day of sharing practice and resources, um, accessing CPD, and just discussing and refining any of their SEN processes and paperwork. And some of those really kind of practical necessary elements of the job. Um, it's an opportunity to reflect on what works and how can we refine those processes and streamline them even more. Um, the SENCO hubs run alongside those. So those are also three times a year and they happen regionally. So that gives an opportunity for the SENCOs within each of the geographic hubs to get together within their local area. And I've been able to join them in those conversations. So again, that can be an opportunity for sharing practice or accessing CPD, but it also provides a forum for addressing any issues that are specific to their area. So they can talk about local challenges and they can think about local systems and they can kind of problem solve around specific issues that they're facing in their particular locality. So my role at the SENCOR networks and hubs has sometimes been to deliver training. Um, sometimes it's been to facilitate discussion or reflection on a key issue or challenge. And sometimes it's been to support in that development of tools and resources and processes that all of the SENCORs are using. The benefit I think of delivering training at those sessions is that it means the same input is being given to every SENCOR. So where a specific issue or approach has been highlighted by the central team, and it's something that they're wanting to promote across all schools, I can deliver some input to all of the SENCOs at once, who can then go back and disseminate that information within their own schools. So the reach and the impact of a single training session becomes far greater and far more cost effective, as Darren was alluding to earlier, than if it was commissioned at individual school level. So we've covered a whole range of topics in this way to, to make sure that there is a core level of 
shared understanding across all schools. So we've covered some topics like attachment. We've looked at precision teaching as an intervention. Um, we've looked at models of understanding emotional needs and emotional well-being, particularly with the increase of SEMH needs that we were seeing um, around COVID and on the back of that. So we've done lots of work around understanding and meeting emotional need. And that's really influenced the work that's then going on at individual school level with the school EPs. So quite often we have situation where SENCOs have attended one of my training sessions at a SENCO network day and then gone back to their own schools and had a conversation with their school EP to say, We've, I've had this session on such and such. I'd really like to roll it out to the rest of my team. Can you help me to develop some stuff to do that? So then the partnership is, is developing further in that the EPs who are working with the individual schools are able to tailor that content even more specifically to work with the SENCOs to look at what exactly is needed to get this approach up and running within your setting, because those school EPs are far better placed with their individual knowledge of the schools than I am to help to do that work at the individual school level. So it's a really effective way of, of kind of disseminating stuff across all schools at once. Um, another benefit of that is that it's been a really nice way for SENCOs across the trust to get to know me as the kind of the trust EP and often people will contact me directly with questions after my sessions or to discuss something further or if they're coming across a challenge in their school and they think oh actually this reminds me of something that Laura talked about at a network meeting they'll just drop me an email and say can, I'm just dealing with this particular situation I know you spoke about this a few months ago can we just jump on a quick call and talk about it and sometimes just those quick or informal conversations, if you like, are a really nice way to troubleshoot and problem solve. And because SENCOs now know me, um, we're able to do that fairly easily. So that works really well too. Um, another big success, I think, has been the development of some really um, robust processes within the trust. So one of the biggest successes, I think, has been the development of the SEND Collaborative. So this is a team of people who, um, meet weekly to do um, to do some work in support of, of colleagues across the trust and the team consists of an experienced SENCO from each of the three geographic areas plus colleagues from the central team um, including people who lead on SEND and safeguarding um, and I also take part in that team as well and what we do is work together to support members of staff from across the trust who have raised concerns about maybe meeting a specific type of need within their setting or understanding a, a, a particular area of need better and what we do is um, the collaborative works by having a, a meeting on a Wednesday morning and any school can make a request to attend that meeting by just sending over a brief outline of what the problem is that they're dealing with and then we hold a solution orientated discussion following a process which is similar in many ways to a solution circle type of process so the problem presenter describes their issue and the team members then take turns to ask questions to either gain clarification or to get some more information before then making suggestions about possible ways forward. So the problem presenter always goes away with some concrete next steps, some ideas for actions that they can implement straight away to start to move the, the situation forward. But then they also have the option of receiving some further follow up support in school from whichever member of the collaborative team is located locally for them. So initially we started off using this process um, as a way to address concerns around SEMH needs because of the increasing prevalence of those across all schools. But actually we've more recently expanded it so that people can come to the collaborative with a problem relating to any area of SEN. And actually the feedback from this has been great. I mean, staff are really appreciating having that space and time to come and think about their issue and tap into the collective ideas and that collective knowledge and wisdom of, of that team of people. And it's also really good actually for all of us who make up that collaborative team because we all have reflected that we all learn something from each other every time we engage in that process because of the variety of knowledge and experience and skills that people are bringing um, we get something different from it every time i always really value the perspectives of the senkos because they have that really practical understanding of implementing approaches on the ground, what are some of the challenges around that and what are some things that have worked well in their context and they can bring that really practical, almost like practice based evidence to the discussion in terms of what they have lived and, and achieved before. And I can bring that psychological perspective and we kind of marry those up and find solutions forward from that. So it's a great learning opportunity for everyone, um, not just the problem presenters, but all of those of us who make up the team. Um, let me think. I mean, I could talk all day about successes, but I won't, I won't cover everything that we've done because there are far too many. But another thing that I think is really worth a mention that 
that's been a really big success over the, the past academic year has been the rollout of the WOW project, so working on what works, which I know is something that you were quite heavily involved with, David, last year as well, um, WOW being one of your kind of passion areas. But this work came about because WOW had been picked up by a couple of members of the central team within the Trust as something that could really benefit lots and lots of their schools. So the team was keen to explore how we could make that intervention more widely available across all of the schools. So what we did was set up a model of delivering a WOW intervention with a couple of interested members of staff shadowing the WOW coach, which was David on a couple of occasions, in order to learn that process over the period of the intervention. And by working with the WOW coach and reflecting on each stage of the process week by week, by the end of the intervention, those staff were then trained up and ready to be WOW coaches themselves and were then in a position to be able to offer that intervention to the schools within their local patch. So that was a really successful way of making use of time to build capacity within the team. And I think that's an important reflection, actually, in terms of success, that those last two examples that I've shared, so the development of the SEND collaborative and also the train the trainers approach, we called it, to delivering well, it is that both of those were based on the idea of working to build capacity and increase self-sufficiency within the trust. So schools are working now, as lots of you will know, in a context of scarcity of local services, and that situation is, is not improving. So where there once might have been local services that schools could tap into to seek advice and support, those things just don't exist anymore. So lots of our work has been built around this core idea of making the trust increasingly self-sufficient so that support and advice that schools might have previously sought elsewhere can be made available internally. So we're working really hard to tap into the wealth of existing skills and knowledge and experience that already exists within the staff team. And there is an awful lot of skill and knowledge within the staff team. Um, so it's, it's finding ways all of the time to tap into that and then harness that and explore how it can be utilised for the benefit of all. So I think that's maybe um, the, one of the biggest successes really that we've achieved is starting to do that and do it really well, identifying where are the strengths already within the trust and how can we make those things available for the benefit of staff and children across all of the schools. So I think probably that's the, the broadest reaching impact of all of them. Brilliant. Thank you, Lauren. Such a, such a great share there in, in all of the types of work that we're doing. I certainly know being one of the on the ground EPs, it's lovely to go into some of the inquire schools and hear your name mentioned and say, oh yeah, we've raised this with Laura and the SEND collaborative. So knowing that we're uh, sort of looking to support schools bottom up and top down as well, um, really creates this nice cohesion, I think, in terms of the work that we're doing and the support that we're providing. And with regards to the WOW, I think, again, this, this was a real success because we had great members of the Inquire team that we were working with, but because of, I think, of the success of how it's been rolled out, more and more schools are interested in the approach, which has actually built capacity in our team because we're now training members of our team up as WOW coaches who can, can carry on um, this type of work. So not only is it building capacity with the Inquire Learning Trust, it's also building capacity within our, within our team as well so you touched upon a few reflections um there laura and that sort of leads me nicely on to my sort of final question um which is what reflections have you had for how educational psychology can work with trusts and for you darren what are your hopes for the future of educational psychology within the inquire learning trust so um oh gosh i mean i get really excited when i start thinking about this because i think um that there's just such potential for educational psychology within trusts and i think a lot of my reflections around this link with that point that i've just made about how we've worked collaboratively with inquire to build capacity within trust for meeting the needs of a, a wide range of learners and i think there is increasing need for trusts to be able to do this because schools in many areas are just rapidly running out of options in many instances for places to go to get some support and advice um, so if we can move to a situation where trusts are working collaboratively with educational psychology to build capacity within for their staff to support each other then we're moving towards a context where there is greater ability of all schools to meet a range of needs without having to look outside for support that might not be there in reality. So for me, my kind of big blue sky thinking around this is that I would absolutely love to see every trust up and down the country having an educational psychologist delivering input at trust level to support them on this journey to, to provide 
um, support for a wide range of needs and to really upskill their staff in all different areas and have that kind of consistent level of understanding about all types of different needs. I think it's just a great way to develop practice and policies and systems that are based on sound psychological principles and you know, take those principles into account whenever important decisions are being made. Um, I think, it, as Darren's already touched on, you know, it's a, it's a really great cost-effective way of working, um, particularly for delivering training, for example, so that you've got staff in all schools being exposed to the same content, the same information, which is a really good way to develop kind of internal consistency within the trust. So, you know, whichever school within a trust a child attends, there are likely to be broad similarities of approach to understanding and meeting their needs. Um, so that, you know, there's something in there about efficient use of resource and it, it makes far more sense to me to work at trust level to, for example, deliver training once to people from across a group of schools, rather than to pay to roll out the same training multiple times for lots of different settings. Um, you know, by, by putting the input at that trust level, you can make sure that the time and the money are used as efficiently as possible for maximum impact, which again ben just benefits everyone more in the long run. Um, and, you know, there's, a, there's an ethicality to that as well for me, because what, when schools are buying in educational psychology services, it's, it's public money. And we have a responsibility to make sure that school funds are being used as efficiently and effectively as possible for the benefit of as many children as, as we possibly can. So there's something in that as well, I think. Uh, for me, I think the model that we've developed here with, with the Enquire Learning Trust has shown us that often with an initial investment of time to set something up to establish a system or a, a process, Schools can continue to reap the rewards of that for a long time. The wow example that I've just spoken about um, illustrates that really well, I think, because now that people within the Enquire Learning Trust have been trained in that approach, they can offer that to their colleagues and the approach can continue to have impact for a long time. So I think if we could move to a situation where there was kind of a trust EP for every trust up and down the country, that would be my absolute ideal. I think that would be amazing. Brilliant. Thanks, Laura. And Darren, your hopes for working with educational psychology in the future? I mean, the, the, the first thing is uh, just to, it's a comment really, uh, you know, you, you, if you view our partnership from a purely sort of commercial basis, you'd say we were outsourcing, outsourcing uh, a, a service, wouldn't you? But it doesn't feel like that. I think that's the, that's the first reflection I have. You know, it's it's much more than an outsourced service, and, and my hope is that that continues. You know, it's a it's a key partnership for in the trust. We want that key partnership to to have some longevity and some resilience, uh, because we know it works for the kids, we know it works for the for the, for the the professionals in the trust. So that's the the first hope that actually we can we can we can sustain it in in the long term. I do think that the, there's massive value, as Laura says there, of of having that. Of having that really key relationship with, 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 uh, with educational psychology, uh, and we could have gone down the route, couldn't we, of 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 not outsourcing, of actually appointing our own educational psychologists, and I know many trusts have done that. We decided not to go down that route because we wanted educational psychologists to be semi semi independent, to work with us be embedded in our team but still have that independent perspective which meant that they could be genuine you could be genuine and critical friends of what we do and what i find underpins our relationship is that um, you see things that perhaps i don't and that's because you've got a you, you've got a different perspective on things but it's also because you've got different expertise and your sharing of that critique massively helps us move forward for all our kids i'd like that to obviously continue and then there are a couple of areas really it really pragmatically that I just think you know my hope is as you continue to grow our, our internal capacity as we as we continue to work really really systematically on that what that means is it creates a bit of extra space for uh, for for us to do more of the the the, the day to day and for you to bring new and really exciting stuff in which will have massive benefits for our children I don't know what they are uh, those are things that you bring to the table and say we've learned about this or we've thinking about this and we always want to be open to saying yeah we think we think we should give that a go and really really test that out and, and evaluate how it works in in practice and uh and then the other thing, we've got new schools coming to the trust. You know, we're, we're a growing trust. We, the DFE are, are very keen that we grow. Uh, we're really careful about how quickly we grow and, and to what extent we grow. But 
we, we are in growth mode. And what we do know is that uh, the schools that we do take in will need to be open to working in this way. So we, that helps with helps us. In, it informs our conversations with potential new new schools within the trust. And then the other one is is, is internal trust succession planning. So uh, you know we we've got a central team in the trust. Uh, we've got a really, really, really st strong cent central function in terms of SEN. It reflects our commitment to it, reflects the number of pupils that we, we have with special education needs. But what you're able to do is to work with work with people at different levels so that when, when it comes to people in the central team electing to retire, we know that the person on people who will, who will take those positions will be well prepared and well developed and have the capacity to take on that new work. So all those are sort of aspirations, but the big one is just continuation, David. That's the, that's the, that's the thing for me, continuation and con constantly seeking to work in new ways for the benefit of the kids. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Darren. Uh, a great share um, and aspirations. Certainly, uh, Applied Psychologies, we are keen to continue to work towards and to achieve um, it both now, but certainly into the future as well. So thank you both for the, for the um, answers to those um, questions. Some really interesting reflections, sharings of practice, processes and systems, and the successes because of that. What I'd like to do um, for the, the sort of second part of the session is to open up questions to, to those who are attending the session. It seems like quite a nice number. So you can either pop a question in the chat function um, and see them come up and respond uh, as they come through or if you want to unmute um, your voice button and ask a question verbally then then that would be fine too so if you just want to have a little bit of a think of some of the questions you might want to ask um, Laura or Darren um, about what they've said this afternoon then um, yeah let, let me know. Thank you Jenny. It's been so interesting to, to kind of listen and hear your your reflection and my question is is about what advice you would give um, both Laura and Darren to a trust working with an EP for the first time. So working in quite a different way to how they've maybe worked before um, and thinking about working with EP at a trust level for the first time. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I really good. think, yeah, um, well, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm jumping in here, Darren. So um, apologies. I'm. I'm just going to go with what's my first thought. I, I think the first thing for me is there's something around um, being realistic with expectations when you are setting off, because uh, like with any new initiative, any new way of working, you know, you're not going to change the world overnight. You've, you've got to be realistic about what it is that you want from a piece of collaborative work. Where are the priorities? And have a real think about how much time you're wanting to invest in, in a piece of work, because the situation we're currently in with our partnership is now several years down the line so this is something that has evolved over over time um the systems and processes that we have in place now certainly weren't there in year one uh, you know it's something that we've evolved as we've uh, we've gone along so i think there is something about um having kind of realistic conversations about what are the hopes and goals for working collaboratively in in this sort of way where would you like to get to and then there is something about how that how that's kind of planned over time and how you, how you manage that year on year. I think the point that David made earlier about our working relationship with, with Enquire being um, a long-term one, you know, we, we have bought into contracts for, for several years at a time. I think that really helps to keep that, that, ground, that thinking grounded in planning over a longer period of time. And um, there, there is something about, yes, knowing where you want to get to eventually, doing that blue sky thinking and that big vision stuff, but then how do we how do we bring that back to build from where we are now, what strengths are already within the team, and how can we implement something that in the first instance meets people where they're at? Because in a lot of cases, this will be a really new way of working with educational psychology for trust. So, you know, being open to it as a, a journey of learning that we can undertake together nobody's going to be approaching this with all of the answers it's something that has to evolve a little bit organically I think all the time does that sort of answer that question absolutely thank you I mean my, my perspective on it is is really similar uh I do think that when trusts are embarking on on this they need to think really systemically uh it's not just about solving a problem in the here and now you're asking what can this 
what's what can this partnership what can this way of working do to 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 affect the long-term health of the trust and what can it do to affect a, a, a huge number of kids and a huge number of staff so you know you, you you've got to think about the people you know about getting the relationship right one of the things for us which i think has been really pivotal is that we've got somebody who we've got somebody who works in our team as, a, as an sen director uh, who's got huge experience of working with children with, ex- with special educational needs and what that means is that the 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 uh, the, the advice and guidance we get from applied psychology is uh, has got an owner then within the trust, and it means that that's likely to be embedded and, and likely to make a difference. It's a, it's also about having a having a really clear view of what the long term is going to look like, uh, and and then just in terms of uh, in terms of the the the, the commercial nature of, of that sort of partnership, you know, we, we've 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 always gone for quality, we've always gone to to looking at contracts based upon what they deliver for children uh, and it certainly worked in relation to ep you know what what's 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 the lowest price isn't always cheapest you know that's the that's what, what we've learned and certainly the way that we work with ep delivers just fantastic value for us but as a trust, you've just got to be aware of that because all procurement decisions are challenged uh, at, at some point whether that's by tr- trustees or, or it's by the fsa Thank you. That's really helpful, Darren. Much appreciated. David, you're on mute. There we go. Sorry, just saying thank you, Jenny, for the question. Um, And just just a question that's come through on the chat um, from David is... um, Apologies if I missed this, but there are planning meetings involving EPs taking place at whole trust level as well as with the individual schools. And if so, how often and who is involved? Yeah, good question. So, um, yes, there are planning meetings at whole trust level, and that is generally me as the kind of main um, central trust EP and the central trust members of the team. So Darren was referring to... um, the SEND director and that there are other colleagues who participate in those conversations depending on what it is in terms of the work that's being discussed but generally the initial planning is done between me and the SEND director we look at our shared priorities for the year and then we think about who in terms of other colleagues is best placed um, to bring on board with different pieces of work so planning meetings with other EPs are still taking place with their individual schools as you normally would so the start of your academic year has every EP meeting with every SEND quarter meeting with their same cause rather to, to plan the priorities for the individual schools. Um, and then there is this kind of other plan, it's kind of a planning mechanism, kind of also just an information sharing mechanism whereby the EPs from within applied psychologies who work across the different trust schools can get together to share information as well about what's happening centrally and how that might impact individual schools. But school EPs can also share with me what's happening in individual schools that also might need to be fed back centrally. Does that make sense? Hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, it sounds sounds um, sounds good to me. Um, obviously, David, if there's anything you want to come back on on that, feel free mm-hmm. to do so. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I'm I'm looking at time, and we've got some other sessions coming up to celebrate our tenth birthday. So we've probably got time for maybe um, maybe one, maybe two um, more questions. So if anyone has another question at this time, um, feel free to put it in the chat or Raise your hand. Um, hello, it's not so much a question as a reflection, I suppose, um, but I was just thinking about the um, the idea that schools kind of get used to their EP and what the EP can deliver, and very often that can kind of lead to a repetition of individual level work. And so I'm just interested to hear about the, the working on what works intervention and perhaps if there was almost like a... Um, a kind of spreading of the success of that and other schools thinking hang on that sounds really good we want some of that and um, so I just think it's really interesting how you've got that opportunity for different feedback loops um, between the schools within the trust the different areas and how that might work. Do you want me to pick that one up, David? Because that's exactly how it works. We we found the the WOW project to be viral really 
so it was started in one place and because we've got lots of professional connectivity across the trust and we do a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of cpd not necessarily around inclusion in sen which the same people come to uh, certainly the stories of success and what happens in different schools get transferred very very quickly we we, we spend an awful lot of pay a lot awful lot of attention to knowledge management across the trust and sharing practice in different ways and certainly those things like the well project have just uh, they, they've, they've, they've 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 gone viral really quickly which meant that we had to have that conversation about how do we facilitate our people delivering that program uh, on your behalf and how do we make sure that it's delivered in a way which has got massive fidelity to its original intentions because that was important to as well it wasn't just about doing a thing called the wow project it was about doing a thing called the wow project which was qualitatively equivalent to the work that david or laura might do with the school Thanks. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, it's actually really important um, at Fidelity. And that's why I went through quite a rigorous uh, training um, route of training up WOW coaches um, and then modeling the WOW process to them, coaching them through that process. And I'm incredibly confident that they'll go and deliver some fantastic WOW projects um, in some of um, the most, um, some of the most sort of classrooms with the most need I think as well which will be helpful for the teaching staff as well and, and their well-being um, as well so yeah I'm really encouraged being a huge fan of wow myself it's great to see it, it sort of it, it growing now um, within the, within the trust following that initial input phase okay um so I'm just going to draw unless anyone has anything else um burning that they'd like to comment or reflect on or to say um, what I will say is that um, should you want to get in touch with us at all and find out a little bit more um, about our, the types of work with, that we do particularly at a whole trust level our email address is info at applied psychologies.com that's info at applied psychologies.com um, our website is applied psychologies com and on there is the learning exchange and this is something that we're trying to really grow this year which will provide information about article blog articles that our team have uh, have written um, our reflections on the types of work that we're doing we've recently started a a series called Coffee With, where um, I get the opportunity to interview members of our team about their passions. So I sat down with Laura yesterday and we did a, a really interesting session about Laura's passion on video interaction guidance, which I know she's really keen to, to, to deliver. Um, so we're going to be sort of putting them on, on the website on hopefully a regular basis. So you get to find out a little bit more about the types of work that we do. If you're on Twitter, we're at at AppPsych. Um, so you can find us on there. I know Twitter is such a fantastic community now for sharing resources, ideas and the types of work EPs are doing. It's a really great community. Um, so, yeah, I just want to offer my huge thanks to Laura and to Darren for your time this afternoon. Fascinating discussion um, and just wonderful to listen to, you know, what has been established in, in, in a relatively short period of time and and how that's going to build into the future so so yeah thanks ever so much thank you